Let's start where we left off. We have a GPU command queue and the command buffer with a single render command encoder. We end encoding right after creating the object, so we have no draw commands to send to the GPU. Clearing the screen with the selected color is the only thing that gets done. Let's change this and add commands to draw a simple triangle. First, we need the vertex positions. Here's a constant array containing X, Y and Z coordinates. Next comes the shader code. Shaders are tiny programs that run directly on the GPU and calculate the color and position of our geometry. For this tutorial, we will store the shader code in a multi-line string denoted by a triple quotation mark. We are using playgrounds which do not support pre-compilation of the shader code. Later in this series, when we move from playgrounds to the complete Xcode projects, we will be able to build metal code along with our Swift code. But for now, we use a string constant. The metal shading language is based on C++. We have our includes and our namespaces. Note that we don't use the C++ standard library, but the special one provided by Metal. Our first function will be a vertex shader, as denoted by the vertex keyword. At this point, we will ignore the details of the shader function, but don't worry, we'll explain everything in a moment. For now, understand that our vertex function accepts a vertex array and the array index. The function body is a simple pass-through. We return the vertex position. The fragment shader is responsible for coloring the geometry. Since we want our triangle to have a blue color for all its pixels, we don't need any arguments for the fragment function, and we can return a constant color with the blue and alpha components set to 1. Now we move to the compilation step, as I mentioned earlier. Since our shader code is in a string, we must compile it at runtime. That's where the metal library object comes into play. We assign it in a do-catch block, because the library creation function will throw an error if the compilation fails. This error will contain helpful information about what went wrong, so it's a good idea to catch it and display it in the console. Now the pipeline descriptor. This object describes what the rendering procedure should look like. At the minimum, we need to set the pixel format and point to our vertex and fragment shaders. You can think of the pipeline state as a lightweight metal object compiled from the pipeline descriptor. It takes some time to create this object with the make render pipeline state call, but the pipeline states created this way can be used in the render encoders and quickly switched without much overhead. Next, we have our command queue, command buffer and the render encoder. Here's where we can finally issue our drawing commands. First, we set the pipeline state, which describes our rendering procedure, or what should happen with the data that we send to the GPU. The setVertexBytes call is the easiest way to send the data to the GPU. It should only be used to send less than 4 kilobytes. For larger chunks, we need to set up our own metal buffers, which we will do in a minute. The stride property of the memory layout object indicates how many bytes we need to skip to get to the next float in the memory. We multiply it by the number of floats in our array to get the total buffer size. The whole memory layout thing may be complicated, especially when it comes to float vectors. We will return to this topic in this tutorial and future ones, so stay tuned. For now, understand that this is how to calculate the buffer size for sending it to the GPU. We have our pipeline state set, so the GPU knows how to process the vertices with our vertex and fragment shader functions. We have also prepared our data, so now it's just a matter of adding the draw call and rendering a triangle with three vertices. And indeed, after running the playground, our triangle appears on the screen. The code for this tutorial is available on GitHub. The link is in the description. When you download it, you will notice that the playground is split into several playground pages. Let's switch to the vertex buffer page to see how to use a custom metal buffer. The changes are minimal. Instead of using set vertex bytes, we create the buffer, providing similar parameters in the call. Then we use this buffer in the render encoder. Notice the index parameter. 
In Metal, we can use multiple buffers and place them at different indices for the vertex shader argument table. We can then annotate the shader parameters with the buffer index. Here we use buffer index 0, which we specified in the set vertex buffer call. We can omit this annotation if you use a single buffer, just like we did in the vertex bytes example. Running the playground results in the same triangle being drawn, so everything works well. Let's now focus on the vertex shader and try to demystify its definition. The vertex keyword indicates that this function is a vertex shader. Next comes the return type, a vector of four floats. The first three components are the 3D coordinates, and the last one, W, is related to the perspective division. More on that in future tutorials. We will set W to 1 for now. OK, now the address space. For vertex shaders, we have a choice between constant and device. You may see the global address space in some older code, but that's now deprecated and is the same as device. So what's the difference? The metal shading language specification is not very helpful in this regard. The primary difference seems to be that the device address space allows writing, while the constant is read-only. The latter is also optimized for situations where different shader cores have to access the same memory area. This is irrelevant in our case, where each shader instance reads from a different position in the buffer. We may choose either address space, but you will see device used more often with buffers. The type of our first parameter is a pointer to the packed vector of three floats. We will get to the packed part in a minute when we talk about alignment. Next comes the index. Vertex shaders can process each buffer element independently, so we need to know which index we are working on. The function body is straightforward. We return the position at the given buffer index, setting the perspective parameter to 1. Let's talk about these packed vectors and memory alignment. Here's a little experiment. What happens if we change a packed vector in our shader argument to a regular vector of three floating point numbers? As you can see, our triangle looks incorrect. So what happened? Here's the official metal shading language specification. The float type is defined as a 32-bit number, so each float occupies four bytes, as you can see on the next page. So you could guess that the vector of three floats takes up three times four equals 12 bytes, but that's not the case. As you can see in the documentation, the vector of three floats is stored in 16 bytes. Only 12 are used to represent the vector components, and the rest is just padding. This alignment is more efficient for processing on the CPU. If you have a lot of data to process on the CPU side, and then need to transfer it to the GPU, Apple recommends using these aligned vector types. But they are defined for the metal shading language, so how do you use them in Swift on the CPU? SIMD types to the rescue. They have the exact alignment and size as their metal counterparts. Here we declare our vertex array as an array of three SIMD vectors instead of a long series of floats. We construct each vector using three numbers, but the vectors occupy 16 bytes each because of padding. If we create the buffer using these vectors, we can use a regular float tree type in the shader code and everything works as expected. Let's add some colors to our triangle. As you can see, each vertex is now described by a structure with a two-dimensional position vector and a three-dimensional color vector with red, green and blue values. The first vertex is blue, the second white and the third red. We need to set up a similar structure in the vertex shader. The float2 and float3 types have the same size and alignment as their SIMD counterparts. The structs must match exactly, so the order of the fields is also important. There is also another structure in the shader code, fragment input. We can't return a constant from the fragment shader because we want the triangle to have more than one color. Instead, we pass that structure as an argument to the fragment shader function. We need to annotate it with the stage in so that Metal knows that this parameter comes from the previous stage prepared by the vertex shader. The vertex function accepts an array of vertices 
and returns the fragment input object. Note that Metal Shading language supports modern C++ aggregate initialization for structures. Metal needs to know which field contains the position data. That's why we use this annotation. It can then interpolate the color over the position, giving us this nice looking gradient. If we don't want this interpolation, we can annotate the color with flat, but this does not look very interesting. And this is how to use structs with buffers. The rest of the code is unchanged, and we now have a colored triangle. In the following tutorial, we will talk more about vertex attributes and index drawing. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching.